Hello and welcome back to Sex Ed. This is part two of our series on the God Worshipping Society and the Taiping Rebellion. In part one, we discussed the political situation in 1840s China and the background and religious influences of Hung Shi Quan, the leader of the God Worshipping Society. If you haven't listened to part one, uh, this might be a good opportunity for you to go back and listen to it first, uh, because we're picking up in 1848, when Hung Shi Quan and his cousin are in charge of a new sect called the God Worshipping Society, and are rapidly gaining converts in a pretty rough part of southern China called Thistle Mountain. At first, um, Feng Yunshan and his cousin Hong Shi Quan were sharing control over their sect. But Feng keeps getting kidnapped by bandits. He's kidnapped twice and held hostage, and both times he's rescued, first by an armed group of god worshippers, and then uh, a bribe gets him free the second time. But this keeps him out of the picture of the leadership for two years, and Hong Shi Quan is preaching and gaining a much larger following during that time. The new converts to the God-worshipping society start going around to temples and shrines in a lot of villages and destroying them. And some of the locals in each of these villages would be really impressed by this and then convert. The, the thinking of these people would be that these old shrines held some sort of power, and since this new religion had come in and smashed them with no repercussions, then the new religion must have power too. A lot of people in each village also reacted violently and tried to retaliate against the God-worshippers for their blasphemy. Uh, the god worshippers would then start arming themselves and then striking back. Uh, and right from, the, right from the start, this sect becomes more militant. The constant fighting that was going on would escalate over the course of a few years from street fights and skirmishes into full-blown warfare. By 1849, the sects had grown to about 10,000 members, uh, most of whom were in armed revolt and vying for power with local militia groups. These militia forces opposing them were generally organized and led by local gentry, people who held positions of power based on the imperial Confucian system. So the Hung Shi Quan visions about purging the Confucian demons uh, was something that went down to the soldiers as propaganda. The other side of the conflict were the bandit groups who had been plaguing the region since the Opium War. As this sort of three-way conflict was escalating, the God-worshipping society leadership is starting to form. With Hong Shi Quan as the prophet, but several other important leaders of almost equal status and religious authority start to emerge. Yang Xiu Qing was a very popular Hakka peasant leader who became uh, a major leader in the sect after he converts his whole extended family. Uh, and other leaders of the God-worshipping society will soon start preaching and having their own followers. One leader has his followers speaking in tongues, uh, which is something imported from um, American missionaries. Yang, in particular, claims to be a faith healer. And these new religious leaders that start popping up uh, all claim to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak for Jesus and the Heavenly Father, which occasionally gives them more authority than Hong Shi Quan himself. So these new religious leaders end up being evaluated by Hung and Feng once they return, uh, and Hung is rescued after he's been kidnapped, um, and the two evaluate these visions and declare them legitimate, which again shows the influence of evangelical Protestant ideas about the Holy Spirit, how direct revelations from God are a part of their belief system, and it's not just uh, Hung who can get them. Rather than fighting against each other, at least at first, Hong, Feng, and four other leaders in 1850 all swear an oath of brotherhood with each other, with Jesus Christ included in the oath as their oldest brother, and then followed in authority by Hong, then Feng, and then the rest of them. This brotherhood oath that they take is another example of the way that they fuse traditional Chinese ideas with their version of Christianity, since this brotherhood oath intentionally is made to resemble other oaths like it that have a somewhat mythical status in Chinese history. And this is specifically, uh, they intend it to, to resemble the, the Peach Garden Oath, which is an event in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, uh, which is a, a very important bit of uh, sort of mythological history. Uh, that it's one of the three great ancient Chinese novels, so it's a pivotal piece of literature. Um, while the new group of leaders were all from the Hakka or other ethnic minority groups, some of them were quite wealthy and resentful of their status as outsiders in the Qing dynasty. And the influx of wealth they brought to the group was used to start manufacturing weapons, mostly spears, but with an ever-increasing number of muskets and cannons. During the five years before the god worshippers became the Taipings, a severe drought also occurred. 
which cause a lot of problems for poor farmers on marginal lands, who would then join the God-worshipping society in droves for protection and food. Another important development in the 1840s for the God-worshippers was Hung's development of his authorized translation of the Bible, based mostly on a German Protestant translation that he'd encountered while studying with Roberts. The Taiping Bible was rewritten and altered to support a few of Hung's earlier claims. In the lands occupied by the God-worshipping society, an altered version of the Ten Commandments became law, with a commandment forbidding all drugs and alcohol added in uh, for good measure. In the Taiping version of the Bible, all references to God's people drinking wine were removed to back up this commandment, and the commandment to honor thy father and thy mother uh, got expanded into a more Confucian-influenced concept of maintaining filial piety. It was early in 1851 that the God-worshipping society went from a large and unruly sect to a full-scale revolution, as the Qing dynasty responded to the disorder by sending in a relatively small force of soldiers to destroy the God-worshippers. Now, this force was only relatively small by the standards of the Qing dynasty. As we mentioned in the last episode, it was still a pretty huge and powerful empire. So the army that they sent was about 30,000 strong. Hung and the god worshippers had been very strictly organized, armed, and well-trained by the time the imperial forces arrived. And encouraged by Feng Yunshan's call for an open uprising, the god worshipping society met the imperial forces in battle and utterly destroyed this first force, uh, managing to decapitate the imperial commander in the opening moments of the battle and then taking advantage of the leaderless state of the army after that. On January 11th, 1851, which happened to be Hung Shiquan's 37th birthday, he announced the god worshipping society from that point on would be a state known as Taiping Tiangao, or the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace, which gives the Taiping Rebellion its name, and is quite uh, ironic considering the scale of warfare that's about to erupt uh, over this kingdom of heavenly peace. Hong would reign over his new kingdom as Heavenly King, with the various military, political, and religious leaders who were his oath brothers all becoming kings as well. Hong's cousin Feng Yunshan became known as the South King, while a wealthy merchant named Wei became the North King, a powerful military leader and preacher, Xiao Chao, Xiao Chao Gui became West King, and the faith healer Yang became the East King. A talented tactician and teenager named Shi Daka, the youngest of the Oath Brothers, became Wing King or Flank King. The Taiping state is best described as a militant theocracy, and the policies this state enacted are really Hung's way of turning his religious visions into law. The rejection of Confucianism and the Manchu ruling class uh, were quite strongly conflated, uh, and Hung's vision was widely known even to the ever-increasing number of low-level Taiping soldiers. One cultural practice brought in by the Manchus had been the distinctive hairstyle known as the Q, which is a single long braid of hair uh, that was mandatory across large parts of China. This hairstyle was a symbol of submission to the Manchus and helped uh, to visibly identify people who were resistant to Manchu rule. Just like the American rock bands in the 1980s and hippies in the 1960s, the Taipings grew their hair out long as a symbol of defiance to traditional authorities, and the, quote, long hairs would quickly become one of the names uh, they were known by. Another cultural tradition that the Taipings opposed was foot binding, which was widespread in other parts of China throughout the 19th century. Uh, the practice is pretty infamous and controversial today and uh, involved breaking a woman's feet at a young age and forcing them into shapes that were considered more attractive. Uh, the Hakka ethnic group was rather unusual among the Han Chinese in that they never practiced foot binding. Since the Hakka were primarily poor farmers and miners, Hakka women were generally involved in manual labor, and a more egalitarian view of gender roles was definitely present in the mostly Hakka upper leadership of the Taiping Kingdom. The Taipings in their territory outright banned the practice of foot binding as they started to spread to other parts of China beyond the Thistle Mountain and began practicing a radical form of gender equality that resembles the Shakers. Um, men and women were strictly separated and lived communally in their own separate barracks, and an effort was made to break up the traditional family unit uh, whose organization was so linked to Confucianism and to replace it with a more military communal order. The Taiping insistence on gender equality even expanded to the battlefield, with groups of female soldiers fighting in their armies as well as men. A strict opposition to all sects would also take root in Taiping ideology, with Hung 
uh, in the early years of the rebellion, attempting to outlaw all sexual relations, including between people who had been married before the Taiping seized control of an area. Now, this policy would not be very well enforced, and eventually the Taiping leadership uh, would have to back down on it, but they still maintained a very puritanical outlook on sex throughout their existence. As we've mentioned earlier, the Taipings also outlawed alcohol, tobacco, and opium, going so far as to include it in their commandments and writing a much more prohibition-minded Bible. And possession of alcohol, tobacco, or opium was enough to warrant a death penalty in Taiping-controlled lands. As the rebellion grew and more local militias organized to oppose the Taipings, the war escalated in size and in the level of violence. Several of the Taiping kings proved themselves to be phenomenal tacticians, and there were a lot of battles that Taiping forces managed to win in spite of what seemed like overwhelming odds against them. And these victories seemed almost miraculous and became great sources of propaganda for the god worshippers, attracting more and more followers. Now, as we've mentioned, there were these roving bands of bandits in the area. Um, now, we've mentioned the roving bands of bandits in the area several times already, but these groups were not necessarily just small local gangs of criminals. Some of these bandit groups were quite large and organized into secret societies, including the Triads, whose goal had always been the overthrow of the Qing Dynasty and the restoration of the long-since deposed Ming Dynasty. Some of these bandit groups were on the scale of small armies, and as Hung and the Taipings started winning victories, a number of these criminal organizations started forming alliances with the Taipings against their mutual foes, the Manchus. The first of the bandit gangs to join the Taipings were actually led by female bandit chiefs, uh, particularly the one was led by a woman named Su San, who commanded soldiers and fought alongside the Taipings until the end of the rebellion, becoming something of a folk hero along the way. Another side effect of the Opium War um, that would have a big impact on the spread of this sect is a huge increase in piracy. Essentially, with the expansion of British maritime trading and the heavy losses of the Qing Navy, piracy had become widespread across the coasts of southern China. Eventually, the Qing and the British teamed up to combat these pirates, but really only succeeded in chasing the pirates towards the interior of China, where they became river pirates instead of ocean pirates, and had started attacking riverside villages. Like the bandits on land, these pirates also started allying themselves with the Taipings once the rebel sect had scored a few victories. These alliances, though, were very pragmatic ones on both sides. It was a very large-scale, militant, Baptist and bootlegger sort of arrangement, uh, and it helped the Taiping Rebellion to grow even stronger and spread even further. At the start of the war, the Taiping forces were using more guerrilla tactics, but as the years went on, more and more land started to fall uh, to Hung's militant, theocratic rule. The Imperial Qing forces were very slow to respond to uprising of the new Taiping Kingdom, and converts uh, to Hong's faith numbered in the tens of thousands within just a few years, with the whole families or villages sometimes converting en masse. As mid-sized cities started falling to the Taiping armies, massacres became common as zealous Taiping forces murdered any soldiers or Qing Dynasty officials they could find. Uh, since they were officially labeled as demons that god worshippers had a holy duty to destroy. The Han Chinese civilians in occupied areas were officially supposed to be uh, spared whenever a city was captured, but this order from Hung uh, was not always obeyed, especially by the kings and the bandit groups who operated with a high degree of autonomy. From 1851 to 53, the Taipings fought and grew larger and larger, with forced conversions becoming increasingly common as they absorbed ever more territory in southern China, until spring of 1853, when they finally arrived at the gates of the huge city of Nanking. By that time, their numbers were in the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions, though the forced conversions and alliances with bandits and pirates uh, it makes it hard to guess how many of the Taiping rebels truly believed in the new faith of their leaders. During the many battles in the first few years of the war, Hung's cousin Feng, the South King, uh, would be killed and would come to be viewed as a holy martyr, while Hung found himself more isolated and with more power over the sect uh, they'd created together. The West King would also be killed in battle during the early years and become similarly revered by the sect after his death. The ancient city of Nanking, as we've mentioned last episode, was the old capital of China and held huge symbolic importance, in addition to being a rich, massive, and strategic city. The city was not well prepared for the hundreds of thousands of Taiping soldiers who came to attack it, and it ended up falling very quickly. The Qing commander in charge of the city's defense was killed quite early in the fighting, and hundreds of god worshippers posing as monks had infiltrated the city months earlier in order to sabotage it from the inside. The Taipings also made use of the mining uh, expertise that a lot of the Hakka miners had uh, in order to undermine some of the walls. 
When the city fell, the Taipings committed one of the largest massacres of the war, executing every Manchu they found in the city. Around 30,000 people were killed in a wide variety of gruesome and horrible ways, and the Taipings diligently set about destroying Taoist, Buddhist, and Confucian religious sites throughout the city. The level of violence and the specific destruction of unique and ancient historic buildings for religious reasons that the Taipings regularly engaged in uh, at this stage comes to be something that can be compared to the activities carried out by the so-called Islamic State in Syria that we've seen over the last few years. Shortly after these massacres, Hong Shiquan and his surviving kings entered into the city and proclaimed it their new capital, renaming it Tianjin, or Heavenly Capital. Yang Shiquan, the East King, had been in command of the soldiers that had captured the capital and was named Prime Minister, becoming the most powerful of Hong's followers. The response from European nations to the Taiping Rebellion was initially quite hopeful. After long years of sending missionaries to China, people were sometimes quite optimistic about the Taiping rebels. It took several years before word really began to spread outside of China about their more extreme and unorthodox beliefs. After moving into his new heavenly capital, Hong Shiquan largely dropped out of the picture, almost for the rest of his life, leaving control of his kingdom, his religion, and his armies in the hands of his surviving kings, uh, while remaining the heavenly king and figurehead of the entire Taiping Rebellion. Hong decided to spend his time mostly in what he described uh, as religious contemplation, quote-unquote, in his new palace, surrounded by his many wives. Um, and while Taipings were still in some places attempting to ban sexual relations, Hong and most of his kings uh, began practicing polygamy. What was common for kings and emperors in China to have large numbers of concubines, Hong and the high-ranking god worshippers again fused Old Testament-inspired beliefs with Chinese traditions, pointing to biblical figures who had multiple wives as justification for this new addition to the beliefs of the god worshippers. Uh, while traditionally concubines had been considered a lesser status than wives, Hong and the god worshippers practiced a form of polygamy that in many ways resembled polygamy in, early, in the early Mormon church, uh, with multiple wives of equal status, uh, with each other. Though the god worshippers practice it on a scale far beyond anything the Mormons ever practice. Hong and his kings also began to ignore their own harsh restrictions on drugs and alcohol, drinking and smoking while their armies continued to deal out death penalties uh, for any commoners caught doing the same thing. Unlike their polygamy, which they attempted to justify biblically, uh, the drinking and drugs were just kept secret from the common people. One thing Hung did manage to do before his isolation really began, though, was finally settle his old score with the Confucian exam system. For government positions in his new heavenly kingdom, a meritocracy based on scholarly examinations would still be the norm, but Confucian texts were replaced with knowledge and understanding of writings including the Old and New Testament, and especially good words to admonish the age, uh, as well as some other Christian texts. In keeping with their ideals of gender equality, these new exams and government jobs gained by passing them were open to women, at least in theory. Unfortunately, no exams for women were ever actually held by the Taipings, as the literacy rate was so extremely low among adult women at the time that the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom would not be able to survive long enough to educate the female scholars that they hoped one day to have. While the first new exams were being organized, the war was continuing to rage on against the Qing Dynasty, with the various Taiping kings expanding the kingdom in various directions. The famines and the pestilence continued along with the war, heightening the apocalyptic tone that the rebellion was taking on and causing countless deaths. In the western part of China, a few years after the fall of Nanking, another religious uprising occurred, which was known as the Panthe Rebellion, in which Chinese Muslims attempted to overthrow the Qing Dynasty as well and also remove the Manchu presence, establishing a Han Chinese Muslim Sultanate. And that gave the Qing yet another thing to worry about. To make matters even worse for them, uh, in 1856, the British and French launched the Second Opium War against the Qing Dynasty in order to even more strongly legalize opium and open China further to the unequal trade treaties instead of just the British-controlled port cities. Rather than taking the fullest advantage of the weakened and distracted Qing Dynasty, the Taipings themselves began falling apart. From 1853 to 1856, Yang, the faith healer known as the East King, had been commanding his own armies and winning victories for the Taiping Kingdom while Hung sat in his palace issuing the occasional religious proclamations. Though Yang was himself considered a prophet and younger sibling of Jesus by the Taipings, he had never been as serious about the new religion as his sworn brother. Yang was notably more cynical about using religion as a way to increase his power and authority in the real world, and was also the most lenient of the kings when it came to dismantling Confucian influence over society. In 1856, 
Yang felt secure enough with his armies behind him to attempt a coup, declaring that God had spoken to him and given him authority to depose Hung as prophet and heavenly king. And Hong Shiquan initially seemed to accept this and summoned all the surviving kings to return to the capital to discuss it. Yang arrived in the capital with his forces around the same time that Wei, the North King, was arriving with his forces. Wei and Yang, in spite of their sworn oath of brotherhood, had long despised each other, and with Hong Shiquan blessing Wei and his soldiers, they assassinated Yang, uh, murdering his entire family in the process. After this shocking act of fratricide, the armies that Yang had commanded for so long were outraged, and Hong Shiquan emerged from his isolation to order Wei arrested for his crime. In a show of justice for the murdered king, Hung invited 6,000 of Yang's remaining soldiers to witness Wei and his conspirators being tortured as punishment. When Yang's soldiers arrived, however, it turned out to be a trap, and soldiers loyal to Wei and Hung Shiquan attacked and slaughtered the unarmed soldiers inside Hung's palace. After Yang and many of his forces had been wiped out, Shi Dakai, the young general known as the Wing King, finally arrived at the city with his army and was horrified to see what his brothers had done. Meeting with Wei, Shi Dakai realized that the North King was utterly unrepentant, and he expressed his opposition to the slaughter that had happened. Wei then decided it was time to strike once more in order to make himself the last king standing and remove the Wing King as a potential threat. Shi Dakai actually managed to slip out of the city safely, but soon found out that his wife and son had not been so lucky and had been murdered by Wei's soldiers. The Wing King returned to the city with his army, demanding vengeance against the North King, and inside the city, Wei began to panic. Like the East King before him, Wei then attempted to overthrow Hong Shiquan as Heavenly King, but the assassins he sent to kill Hong in his palace were stopped uh, with the help of female soldiers known as the Old Sisters, a group of Hakka women who had been fighting for Hong since the early days of the God-worshipping society. Rallying what was left of Yang's old forces, as well as his most devout followers, Hung overwhelmed Wei's forces inside the capital city, executed Wei, and sent his head to Shi Dekai. This flurry of betrayals and coups left over 30,000 Taipings dead, and of the original sworn brotherhood, only Hung and Shi Dekai remained alive. The Wing King would then take his army and fight on for several more years, and Hong Shiquan would return to his isolation in his palace, but it was the beginning of the end for the Taipings and their sect. After the death of Yang, Hong Shiquan's other cousin, Hong Rangan, finally came back into the picture. As we mentioned back in part one, Hong Rangan had not been allowed to follow his cousin off in their wanderings. Uh, Hong Rangan uh, had maintained his sincere interest in Christianity and had studied with Western missionaries in Hong Kong, eventually forming a much more mainstream and moderate Protestant understanding of the religion. Those teachers and friends all tried to forbid him from going to join his rebel cousin. Hong Rangan ignored them and went to Nanking to take up a position as prime minister of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. He would eventually become a very important link between the Taipings and the wider world and focus his efforts on turning his cousin's theocratic military dictatorship into a functioning state. The Baptist preacher, Isakar J. Cox Roberts, uh, under whom Hung had once studied and been rejected, made his way through the war zone to get to Nanking and spend some time as an advisor to the Prime Minister Hong Rangan. But Roberts would ultimately leave the city due to his outrage at the actions and blasphemies of his former pupil, Hong Shiquan. In 1860, however, the tide really began to turn against the Taipings after their disastrous attempt to take the city of Shanghai. Shanghai was a city with a very large foreign presence where French, British, and other European traders and merchants lived. Some of the Taiping forces attacking the city actually seemed to think that their fellow Christians would welcome them, or at least remain neutral. The French and British, however, had no intention of seeing this city fall into the hands of the Taipings, especially since they had just won the Second Opium War and squeezed even heavier trade concessions out of the Qing. A fighting force was assembled by the Qing to defend the city, uh, which would eventually become known as the Ever Victorious Army. This force was made up mainly of Chinese recruits as well as soldiers from the Philippines, but was led and organized by American, British, and French mercenaries, including an American sailor from Salem, Massachusetts named Frederick Ward, and a British officer named Charles Gordon, who was a decorated veteran of the Crimean War. This new international fighting force began adopting European-style training and tactics and was able to defend the city and repulse the Taiping attack. 
While the loss itself wasn't catastrophic for the Taipings, it had ended the official neutrality that the British and French had maintained in the conflict up until that point uh, and pushed them into supporting the Qing. It would take another four years after the attack on Shanghai to fully defeat the Taipings. While the ever-victorious army and Charles Gordon get a lot of attention in the, during this time period, especially in the West, much more of the Taiping lands would actually be reclaimed by the armies led by Chinese generals such as General Cao, who is probably the person you're most likely to have heard of, since many years later a popular American Chinese food dish would be named after him. Although the reason it's called General Cao's Chicken is something of a mystery, there's a lot of conflicting stories, um, but the actual connection between the general and the chicken is pretty nebulous. The Qing armies uh, also began adopting more European-style armaments and tactics and the Taiping slowly lost more and more territory, with their fanatical soldiers often choosing to fight to the death rather than to surrender. Slowly over the course of a couple of long, bloody years, the bandits, pirates, and other allies of convenience started to abandon Hong Chi Quan, and ultimately Shi Dakai, the Wing King, took his army and attempted to fight the Qing alone. He was ultimately captured and executed by slow slicing, which is also known as death from a thousand cuts. During the final siege of Nanking by Qing forces, Hong Shi Quan himself died at around the age of 50, although the cause of his death is pretty unclear. Some sources say it was just an illness, others claim he was poisoned by his enemies or that he committed suicide. It's also very likely that it was a bit of all of the above, since the city was under siege and running out of food and people had resorted to eating some dangerous plants, so Hong may have inadvertently poisoned himself that way. When the city was recaptured by the Qing, it suffered yet again another massacre. This was described as being even more severe than the one the Taipings had inflicted when they first captured it. Hong's son would briefly be named Prophet and Heavenly King as well, but he was soon captured by the Qing and executed as well, along with Prime Minister Hong Rengan. In the aftermath of the war, the God-worshipping society was utterly wiped out, and the Hakka suffered even more brutal persecution at the hands of the Qing Dynasty. Owning a copy of Good Words to Admonish the Age became punishable by death, and a lot of Taiping documents and sources were burned which is why things like uh, Hung's death are kind of hard to figure out, uh, as well as things like why he had his falling out with Roberts. Due to a combination of plague, famine, and 13 years worth of brutal massacres by both sides, it's estimated that between 20 to 30 million people died. The God-worshipping society and the failed war to establish the heavenly kingdom of great peace caused more deaths then than all of World War I, making this one of the largest and most devastating wars in all of human history. While the religious elements of the Taiping Rebellion would be gone forever, their status as revolutionaries would inspire later Chinese leaders. Sun Yat-sen, the 20th century revolutionary and father of the Republic of China, was himself of Hakka and Cantonese ancestry and admired the nationalistic and anti-Qing elements of the Taipings. Sun Yat-sen would himself even be baptized as a Christian, which influenced his revolutionary ideology in a profound way. Uh, though he was baptized in the Congregational Church of the United States and was much more tolerant and moderate than the Taipings had ever been. In 1908, more than four decades after the end of the Taiping Rebellion, Sun Yat-sen would succeed in overthrowing the Qing Dynasty and establishing the Republic of China. While Hong Shi Quan today has at best a mixed reputation, other Taiping officials like Shi Dakai and Hung Rengan are remembered much more fondly. Uh, with the rise of communism in China, the popular view of the Taipings would change again, with communist historians identifying strongly with the Taiping practice of communal land ownership and redistribution of wealth. Uh, while these Taiping practices could be described as proto-communist in some ways, uh, they were in fact denounced specifically by Karl Marx during the uprising uh, who wrote about the Taipings as more dangerous and oppressive than the Qing. Another more religious aspect that developed in China uh, was a deepening hostility towards emerging sects and new religious movements. Within just 13 years, the God-worshipping society went from being uh, three cousins wandering around with uh, custom-made swords to a theocratic kingdom with millions of followers and massive armies, after all. The various Muslim uprisings that coincided with the Taiping Rebellion also caused their share of devastation, and the modern-day suppression in China of emerging religions, like Falun Gong, can be linked to some very real fears of seeing something like this happening again, if new sects are allowed to grow. But that's something we'll have to cover in another episode. Thanks for joining us for this overview of the God Worshippers and the Taiping Rebellion. 
Um, as I mentioned in part one, this is a, a topic that's fascinated me for a long time, and I was really excited to get to, to research it more and dig into it. Um, and there's a lot that we weren't able to cover that, that went on during this. It, it's a massive war, uh, and again, went on for 13 years. So there's countless amazing little stories in there um, that we didn't really get to talk about. But if you're interested, I, I highly recommend um, reading more, and I'll, I'll put some links in the show notes uh, for books that are, are quite fascinating. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that chronologically, this, what really is a Chinese civil war, is taking place at the same time as the American Civil War. Meanwhile, the American Civil War, there are about 50,000 books written about that. And I, I believe yeah. that's a conservative estimate. I've seen that estimate cited, but that was years ago. Um, and uh, I can't imagine there are as many about the Taiping Rebellion. No, there's not. It definitely, um, especially here in America, it definitely gets overshadowed um, by our own Civil War. And um, that's something that, uh, yeah, I was always I was a bit annoyed by because there's so much going on uh, in the Taiping Rebellion, and it's, it's so huge and important. And I also, for a long time, have been uh, been annoyed by how little representation in media there is, uh, how many stories there are going on in this that would make amazing movies or television shows. There are, you know, uh, fascinating stories about, about various bandits and their life stories of how they came from nothing and became uh, these powerful people. There's a, a lot of very intense military uh, conflict stories. There was uh, one attempt to uh, adapt a biography of... Um, Frederick Ward, the American mercenary in the uh, Ever Victorious Army, into a movie, but that ended up, um, they completely changed the setting and said, let's put it in Japan and call it The Last Samurai, um, which that, that was the closest that I think Hollywood's ever come to, to tackling the Taiping Rebellion as a setting for a movie. I have to imagine one of the reasons is just, you mentioned the amount of sources that, that the Manchus intentionally destroyed, whereas the American Civil War, we've got not only government documents about that, but also sort of the more intimate documents. Like, you think about Ken Burns' Civil War documentary. That story is told not just through, like, the top-down government side of things, but also you've got journals and the, the stories of the people who are on the ground. And in, in your sort of research, how much of that, like, are you able to find, like, the actual... There's, there's a decent amount. Um... They're, again, like a lot of them were scholars and, and quite literate. So there, there are, for example, I mean, Good Words to Admonish the Age, there's only four copies left, but we have copies, um, which now you can, I think, find them on the internet. Um, I actually haven't read Good Words to Admonish the Age uh, personally, but... And uh, with the American Civil War, I think another big aspect is just the level of violence after the war, where Robert E. Lee and um, Jefferson Davis, they were pardoned and allowed to live after they lost the American Civil War and were allowed to write and write and write and put down all their recollections. And the Taipings, I mean, from the leadership down to the common soldiers, it was very unlikely that you would be left alive. Uh, they tended to fight to the death and there was no surrender uh, offered or given on either side for the most part. So yeah, they there's the old cliche of the winners write the, the histories, but in the American Civil War, uh, a lot of the losers of that war were the people who had a lot of time to write down everything that they remembered. So that was a war where the losers wrote a big chunk of the history uh, and were able to, to sort of try and defend themselves and explain what their cause was and, and reframe it in ways that made them look good. Um, which leads to subsequent mem like yeah, memorialization. Which, yeah. And then, yeah, with the Taiping Rebellion, you'd be very hard pressed to find anybody uh, alive after this who, who fought for the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, it was much, much more fire and sword. Um, so that's definitely a factor as well. It's also intriguing how some would consider, some scholars considered them uh, quote unquote proto communists, but uh, definitely one of the big areas of contrast between uh, sort of the Taipings and other what you might think of as communist states. It's the religion it's element. The religion, it's, yeah. it's clearly a theocratic dictatorship, whereas in other in other communist states that we've talked about briefly here, you sort of see Russia, for example, USSR, state-sanctioned atheism. Yeah, and in China as well, eventually. Um, which, yeah, they, they can sometimes understate uh, the importance of religion to the Taiping Rebellion when they're trying to frame it uh, as a, as a proto-communist thing, which there definitely were elements that you can see the connection, the communal land ownership and the gender equality and some of the um, ideals that they did hold in common with, with communists. But yeah, it, I think it, it is interesting that Karl Marx himself was alive during the Taiping Rebellion and commented on it and, and was 
again, like the like the Christians actually in, in a lot of European countries, was initially hopeful um, and and thought, okay, well maybe this is a good thing. And then as they found out more about it, they said, oh, no, this is terrible uh, and turned very strongly against it. So thanks for joining us uh, for episode 11 of Sect Said. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you liked the episode, please tell your friends, share, uh, give us a, a like uh, review on iTunes. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is released under a Creative Commons, Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives License. It was recorded at LEADER, the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed by Sex Ed do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.